Starting with verse 30 in Luke chapter 1, very familiar passage, it's the Christmas story, but we're going to go, God has a revelation for us today. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. And he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Then the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, here it is, I love this path, this part of the story. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, verse 37. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town in which Elizabeth lived. Father, I pray for anointing that will enable me to make the word speak clearly. I claim authority this day to be able to speak clearly, to speak concisely, May the word be different for every ear that has to listen today. God, we believe from Atlanta to Virginia, from California to New York, around the world, you will meet each of us exactly where we are. And we claim that authority now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Go in the supermarket, walk in the mall. One of the things that sometimes frustrates me about believers is how quick we are to just use statements that kind of roll off of our tongue nilly vanilla, just so matter of factly. How you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. Thank you. How are you today? Blessed by the best. And I think sometimes we don't stop to really think about the words that are coming out. It's just processed religious rhetoric. This whole theory, motif, if you will, behind favor. I want you to understand favor is not automatic. <laughs> Watch this. Favor is not guaranteed. If you want to know the subject today that I'm going to preach from, it's the subject, it didn't just happen. Can I just ask a very hypothetical and perhaps rhetorical question? What made God choose Mary? eight o'clock this morning we alluded to the fact that the text says Mary found favor. Elder, I began to just do some research, just think through this whole word, this favor motif. It's amazing. If you go to Webster, definition number three for favor says, I love, I love this definition. Sister Shannon, definition number three under favor in Webster is excessive consideration. Whoa. So that means when I declare I am favored, God has released excessive consideration on me. That's why I know it's not automatic and it's not guaranteed. Everybody, I hate to bust your bubble, everybody listening today around the world, everybody watching, whether you're connected through the house stream or through YouTube or Facebook, everybody today is not favored and everybody listening today perhaps will not become favored because 
it doesn't just automatically happen. It doesn't just happen. It's excessive consideration. Watch this. The second definition, definition number five is something given as a souvenir at a party. You know, party favors. Definition number six, watch this, is a state of being ahead of your opponent. So you can say, um, my team is winning, or my team is winning 14 to 3. We are in favor. We're in front, 14 to 3. And then finally, definition number eight was support or advocation for. I'm in favor of. So when, when politicians are voting and you ask them a question, they'll say, I'm in favor of this, or I'm in favor of that. It means you can count on my support or my advocation. Two of those definitions jump out for me. That when I declare I have stumbled into favor, number one is it is excessive consideration. That God is considering me at a level that he doesn't necessarily consider everybody. Now watch this. Elder and I have this, this dialogue at home all the time. I, I hear you. I feel you in the spirit. You say, but God is no respecter of person. Well, if God is no respecter of person, then how does Mary find favor? Because it's clear that obviously God seeks her out and uses her. The Bible says, we're not Catholic, but it says she is favored among women. So obviously God had some form of respect a person that he goes and gets Mary, a little woman, a little 13, 12 year old, a baby, a child, a girl from Nazareth and favors her to bring forth the child. I want you to understand that God is no respect of person as far as blessing and bringing them, God help me to get this clear, bringing them into body of Christ. So what he says is, whosoever will, I will receive everyone. I don't turn anyone away. But I want to suggest that we walk that theological precept by saying, okay, I got Bible for you. God says many are called, but few are chosen. So there are some differentiating realities about how God deals with us. And so what I've learned is I'm trying to figure out what is it that Mary did that caused the favor of God to fall upon her since it doesn't automatically happen and since it's not guaranteed and I want to suggest that the first thing we will never you will never I will never become favored by God until I can start demonstrating righteousness okay now I knew I knew that was gonna mess you up one of the things that's preventing people in the body of Christ especially in the Baptist Church from becoming as favored or becoming favored is this once saved always saved theological precept that I can join myself to the kingdom and then act and operate any kind of way I want to operate with. Let me share it. I got a good story for you. The other day, I'm in the store and I'm making groceries. I'm in the store and I'm making groceries. One of the things I tried to do differently during COVID, when I examined myself, I said, what are the things that I can perhaps do that are within my pay grade to be able to make life a little bit easier for elder? And one of them was, I started routinely going to the grocery store. Now, I still don't get to go to the grocery store and pick out all the meats and things like that because I'm not qualified but I try to go do the basic stuff. So the other day I go to the grocery store, I get the water, I get her lemon water, I get her some regular drinking water, I get the dog food, I get um, the grapes and the tomatoes, the salad, all the stuff that's on her list. She puts the list on the refrigerator. And then I'm in the grocery store, I go through the line, it's like eight people in the line. Watch this Aisha, so I'm sitting in the line, I get in the line and I pay for all the stuff. I swipe the card and then I get out, watch this, here it is, I get out to the car and when I'm putting the groceries in the car, I realize that the seasoning for the chicken is still in the basket. Y'all gonna miss this turn. It's still in the basket and has not been rung up. Now I'm in the parking lot. I am in the parking lot. It's only like a dollar and 39 cent. I'm in the parking lot. And I said, well, you know, the reality is as much as I shop in the store, this dollar 39 cent is not gonna make or break the store. And I get ready to get in the car and drive off. I have put the chicken seasoning in the car with me. And when I'm getting ready to drive out, God says, the Holy Spirit says, you didn't pay for that. That's stealing. And I'm like, I do not feel like pulling back in a parking space, 
going back into the grocery store, getting back in a line. First of all, I don't even want the stress of trying to walk in the grocery store with the seasoning in my hand. And then somebody say I was shoplifting and I got to deal with all this. But my conscience would not let me because here's what happened. God said, watch this. I'm hoping I'm helping somebody. God said, so are you willing to abort the favor on your life over a dollar 39 cent chicken seasoning? Are you really going to let me get so upset with your conviction today that you will risk me pulling the favor? I, you know, at eight o'clock, I talked about the fact that all of us are blessed if we are children of God. But there's another another level to the covenant that God releases favor and so the reality is what I had to deal with sister Shannon is I got back in the parking space went back in the store and watch this then I get in my prideful posture so when I go back in the store I want to go over to the manager and tell the manager the um the um cashier forgot to ring this up and I want to make sure I pay for it so that I could have the privilege of the cashier and the manager saying oh thank you so much for being so honest and coming back in and when I walked back in the self checkout was empty God said go get in the self checkout you don't have to get in the line and go back through the same cashier but I wanted to go back through the line so the cashier would know that the Mount's pastor that Valerie's husband that Kimberly's daddy really is an honest and righteous guy and what I've learned is that once you start to display righteousness so you can be seen it no longer is true righteousness because righteousness is what you do when nobody else is around when nobody ever knows what you've done and so what I did is I went over to the self checkout I put the thing in I bleeped it through the scanner I paid my money and I walked back out now I felt better and now I really feel better because I realized that favor doesn't automatically happen favor comes to those people who learn how to distribute demonstrate righteousness I can show it to you in verse 34 it says then said Mary unto the angel how shall this be seeing I know not a man okay y'all missed the turn with me right there put some hearts I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen through the hearts the reality is God releases favor on those of us that have demonstrated righteousness when righteousness was not the popular thing to do and the reality is righteousness is really driven by when you know not a man many of us are not righteous because you know too many men I'm okay I'm not trying to make it physical get your mind out the gutter what I'm talking about is whenever somebody in the flesh has more influence over you than God does you have then ceased to operate with righteousness because righteousness is when you operate by the conviction that God has given you and you start to operate that way regardless of what anyone else is doing it's kind of like y'all remember when you were a child and you would come home and you, you would tell your mama can I go to the party and your mama would say no you can't go to the party and she would say well you know so and so is going to the party and your mama would say so if so and so go jump off the mountain are you going to jump off the mountain if so and so goes jump off the bridge or she would say if your mama was like mine she said what so and so is doing in her house ain't got nothing to do with what's being done in this house and I say you're not going to the party that's what real righteousness is can you do what God has asked you to do when all around you people are doing something different I'm not going to allow the influence of other people to taint what God has asked me to do I don't care if anyone else doesn't tithe I'm going to bring my tithe I don't care if no one else praises God I'm going to praise God and what I want to suggest to you is many of us have aborted righteousness because we've become so in influenced by knowing man you can see it in church when we were in church there were some people that were praising God and some people that were standing up because other folks that were praising God praise God okay you just missed it stop rewinding and play what happened now is you got to stand up in your living room because you just feel like standing up you're not standing up because you got convicted by the lady sitting two chairs down because she's standing up now you want to stand up no if you really praising God now you really praising God because you praising God in your bed room where no one can see you. You're praising God in your car where no one can hear you. You're praising God sitting there scrambling the eggs where nobody really cares what kind of dress you have on. The reality is when you start to demonstrate righteousness, the reality is you are making sure that you're operating your relationship in line with what God has asked from you regardless of what anyone else is doing. It's really you not having any man in front of God, any flesh in front of God. That's why Matthew 6.33, I love it. You know how it reads in the King James Version, seek the kingdom of God first and his 
rich, his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. I love the New Living Translation though. It says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Can I suggest to you right now that the reason why God chose Mary, it didn't just happen. God looked for somebody that he could trust that was demonstrating righteousness and Mary had already demonstrated it. And I'm coming to declare over you and I, for those of us that have stayed the course in the midst of a pandemic, you continue to bring your tithe, even when it was not able to be displayed by coming to the altar and putting it in a bucket. You continue to do that which God asked you to do. You continue to be obedient. When God sees us demonstrate righteousness, it releases something in the covenant relationship that God has with each of us and he will choose you and drop favor on your life. Is there anybody around the world? Come on, shout out at your boy right now. I'm talking to you in California. I'm talking to you in Maryland right now. I declare that because of your demonstrated righteousness, God is getting ready to release a season of favor. Your children are going to go to college for free. You're going to be able to walk into the dealership and get deals on automobiles that no one else has ever been able to get. You're going to move into houses that you don't really qualify for. You're going to get promoted to jobs that you never even applied because God always responds to demonstrating righteousness. She says, I'm a virgin. I have no man in front of me. And can I suggest that when you get confident enough in your faith to be able to stand when no one else understands why you're standing, to stand when nobody even thinks what you're standing for is worth standing for, that's when you demonstrate righteousness. So number one, you've got to learn to demonstrate righteousness. But watch this. I love Sister Bonnie. Can I talk to you? Come on, lean into the screen real close because I want to talk to you all the way in wood Bridge, Virginia, because not only does God release favor on folks that demonstrate righteousness, but what God does is he loves folk. Here it is. I'm going to preach to myself right now. People, Pastor John, who deflect ridicule. Okay, y'all missed the turn. Watch this right here. Um, Minister Troy, I love the fact that in verse 36 it says, what's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age, exclamation point. People used to say she was bound. Oh God, y'all sit, sit up on the screen. Let me talk to you personally. People used to say, people used to say, who am I preaching to around the world? You have fallen victim to what people said about you instead of letting it sink in that what they said about you doesn't define you. I need somebody that'll get up in their living room right now. Somebody that'll pull over in the car and start to raise their hands and start to give God glory because you're no longer defined by what people used to say. What I've learned now, if you're living a life, oh God, I'm preaching to myself. If you're living a life and nobody's saying anything about you, if you're living a life and somebody doesn't have a problem with what you're saying, if you're living a life and somebody doesn't understand what God is doing in your life, if you're living a life where everybody thinks you're walking the right way and everybody's proud of what you're doing, I want to suggest to you, you're probably not making a whole lot of changes for the kingdom of God. But when I start to walk in my anointing, when I start to walk in my assignment, it's inevitable somebody's going to ridicule me. So I've come to declare over you and I today, what you've got to learn how to do is deflect the ridicule. Let them laugh at you. Let them talk about you. Let them say what they need to say. Let them judge you. Let them lie on you. Stop trying to repay evil for evil. I love the fact that Elizabeth is never recorded as talking about the folk that have given her the title of being barren. She never judges the folk that started to say something about the fact that she couldn't have children. Because here's what I've learned, God help me. What I've learned is the best comeback for people that are talking about you is success. The best comeback for people who are lying on you is survival. The best comeback for people who said you'd never be anything is to make sure you become everything that God has ordained you to become. Do I have a worshiper around the world? I feel like we ought to take about 10 seconds right there and just say, God, I'm not worried about what anybody thinks of me. I'm not worried about what anybody says about me. All I want to know is, do you still love me? Do you still have an anointing on me? Are you still calling me? That's why Luke 136 says, people used to say she was barren. Can I declare over you right now? People are gonna used to say you were nothing. Now they're gonna have to say you're a college graduate. They used to say 
you never amount to anything. Now they're going to have to say you own a business and got a house. They used to say you would never own your own business. You would never own your house. Do I have anybody that will declare, God, I'm not worried about what they used to say. I'm worried about what you are saying. I'm not worried about what they used to call me. I'm worried about what are you calling me right now. And God is calling me the head and not the tail. God is calling me above and not beneath. And I declare right now that I have not seen and ear have not heard what God is getting ready to do in your life and in my life. It doesn't automatically happen. Choose his favor for those who, number one, demonstrate righteousness. Number two, for those who can deflect ridicule. First Peter chapter 4 verse 14. I'm trying to slow myself down because point three is going to drive us crazy. First Peter chapter 4 verse 14 says, If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed. Oh God. Can I ask you something? Satan is so dumb that he didn't realize when he talks about you, he's setting you up for blessings. Listen to what 1 Peter says. It says, if you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ. So if I'm insulted for trying to do what God has asked me to do, it doesn't say I might be blessed. It says, you will be blessed for the glorious Spirit of God rest upon you. Here's what's so crazy, y'all. It didn't just happen. It happened because she was demonstrating righteousness. It happened because she and Elizabeth were able to deflect ridicule. Oh, God, I feel, Kendrick, I feel something pushing me right here. But it happens thirdly because you and I and many other people around the world. Sister Shannon, Brother Choi, watch this. Favor shows up in the lives of those of us that have displayed resilience. Can I just get somebody around the world, stand up in your living room and shout to the top of your lungs, I'm still here. I don't know who needs to help me celebrate this. But with all the hell you've been through and all the stuff you've lost, all the stresses, strains, and situations you had to deal with, I give you permission right now. Open the front door up. Go out on the stoop and just announce to all the witches, all your neighbors, and all your haters, I'm still here because there is something that moves God when he sees people that get knocked down, but they stand back up. There is something that moves heaven when he sees people that can endure hardship like a soldier and declare just like in the Bible, though you slay me, yet will I still serve him. I got Bible for you, verse 39. It says a few days later, Mary got herself together and hurried up to the hill country in Judea. I need about a thousand of you around the world that are blessed by the providence of God to be able to listen to a little preacher born in Portsmouth to just get up and say with everything that's going on in my life I survived it I cried a lot but I survived it I hurt a lot but I survived it I lost a lot but I survived it and watch this how do you know you're resilient you are not resilient just because you survived it you're resilient when you can survive it and not be angry. You're resilient when you can survive it and not be jealous of folk that didn't lose what you have. You're resilient when you can survive it and still give God glory. When you can survive it and still praise Him for what He's doing in somebody else's life. Still celebrate what He's doing in somebody else's life. Mary says, the reason why you know I'm resilient it's not just because I'll get back up, but I'll get back up with no bad attitude. I'll get back up not being mad at God. There are many of you that are listening to me today. You say you're resilient. You got back up, but you're mad. You got back up and you're angry. You can't celebrate when your girlfriend getting married 
because you're still mad. Yeah, you survived divorce, but you have not proven you're resilient because now you're still mad. You're mad at every man you see. You got something in your heart that needs to be dealt with because when you're resilient, you can go through divorce and get up and go buy a bridesmaid dress and stand up for somebody else and not sit there with an attitude on your face, with a frown on your face. I'm talking to those of us that God knows not only are you resilient, but it's time for him to return everything that the canker worm destroyed. It's time for him to give you back everything that the enemy came and snatched. You're resilient. That's why I love 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. It says we're pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, hunted down, but we're not abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. I declare over you, here it is, the best part of the sermon right now. God told me to tell you two words, two words that will change your life. Get up, get up, get up. He's not coming back. They're not going to offer you the job. Yes, you lost the house, but you still got breath. You still got praise. Get up. Prove to God that you qualify for favor by demonstrating righteousness, by deflecting ridicule, by displaying resilience, and then finally, I'm there, by declaring reliance. I love Mary. When we get to verse 8, 38, here's what Mary says. The Bible says, after all this dialogue with the angel, Mary responded, well, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. It's as if the angel was waiting for Mary to simply acknowledge, God, what you're talking about doing, I can't do by myself. I'm your servant. Can I suggest to you, you can't be the Lord's servant only when it's comfortable. You got to be able to declare like Mary, may everything that you have said about me come true. The text then says, and the angel left her. Oh God. It was as if the angel was not going to leave her until she started to declare her reliance on God. So can I look you straight in the eye, sitting in your living room? I see you. You just sat up on the edge of the bed. You weren't even paying attention, but then the Holy Spirit tapped you. Because what God is trying to do in your life, it will require favor, not just the blessing of God. What God is trying to do in your family is going to require favor. And regardless of what anybody else does, you are the person that has to demonstrate the righteousness. I feel that God in the Spirit. I hear Him telling me I'm prophesying. Doesn't matter what your children are doing. Doesn't matter what your spouse is doing. You are the one. It's not by coincidence that Joseph is not even mentioned in this whole chapter. This is God and Mary. You're the one that's going to have to display righteousness and demonstrate righteousness. You're the one that's going to have to learn how to deflect ridicule. You're the one that's going to have to display resilience. And then right now in your house, in your living room, in your car, in your workplace, you're the one that's going to have to declare, God, I'm your servant. I'm your servant. I work for you. Even if I work at the church, I work for you. And I'm saying, I release you to do everything that you have said you were going to do in my life. The reason why I can do that, last verse of the day, it has become one of my favorite verses. We got too many people that are trying to fight. There's a spirit of anger that's been released over our nation. I do not have to fight 
for what belongs to me. I have to faith for what belongs to me. Why? Because Exodus 14, 14 says, the Lord himself will fight for you. I got a revelation the other day and I want to leave it with you before I give you the invitation and, and lead you in communion. Listen to what this says. When I am favored by God, the Lord doesn't delegate my fighting. Okay. Come on, shoot your boy some hearts. I'm trying to teach you something that hopefully is going to change your life. When I'm favored for God, watch this, Sister Shannon. He doesn't send an angel to fight for me. When I'm favored by God, he doesn't send people to fight for me. According to Exodus 14, 14, when I'm favored by God, the Lord himself fights for me. Whole nother revelation that God gave me the other day. He said, son, if you just stay the course, you love me so much and I love you so much that I'll fight for you myself. So wherever you are right now around the world, I want you to understand, it's not going to automatically happen. It didn't just happen. Mary found favor because she demonstrated righteousness. She deflected ridicule. She displayed resilience. And she declared reliance. Here's the big question. I know you're blessed, but if you want the favor of God, you've got to make some decisions just like Mary. Decision number one is to accept the Lord as your Savior. If you want to do that today, all you got to do is text the word accept to 71441. Ooh, God, I feel your glory in the room. God, I feel your glory in the room. God, I feel your presence in the room. Thank you for arresting that sister that stumbled into the stream today, God, that was getting ready to commit suicide. And today she declared, if you don't speak to me, God, I'm going out and I'm going to jump off the bridge. God, thank you that right now in the name of Jesus, because of the foolishness of preaching, she's now able to deflect the ridicule of family members, co-workers, neighbors, relatives, and she's not going to give up. There's too much potential in her, too much assignment in front of her. So God, we thank you right now for her courage and her resilience to pick that phone up and make a decision for you right now. If you desire to rededicate your life to Christ, all you got to do is text RESTART to 71441. And last but certainly not least, if you believe I am a spiritual voice in your life, you need someone that's praying for you, someone that you're connected to. And if you believe the Mount Global Fellowship of Churches, the Mount Virtual, Mount Chesapeake, is the place where God has ordained for you to be connected. Regardless of where you are around the world, we will serve you, we will care for you, we will cover you, and we will keep you connected. All you've got to do is text the word Mount Up, M-O-U-N-T-U-P, to 71441. Now watch this, as soon as you text, you're going to be prompted. It's just one or two things you got to do, real simple. Don't procrastinate. Don't put it off. Do it today. Don't rob us of the privilege of being able to be used by God to help you pursue and find the favor of God. Wherever you are, would you grab some bread, some wine? If you don't have wine, get some water. If you don't have water, get some orange juice, grape juice apple juice piece of loaf bread the Bible declares that on the night in which the Lord was betrayed I can never get around that scripture on the night in which the Lord was betrayed can you imagine sitting there with people that are stabbing you in the back and still having enough conviction to be obedient to God that on the night in which you were betrayed you take bread break it and you tell them this is my body that's going to be given for you on Calvary and he told them commune together 
we commune together now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Bible declares that on that same evening, he took a cup and he said, this cup represents my blood that's going to be shed for you. Oh God, and he told them, take drink ye all of it. And that night, all of them, that's why grace is amazing. All of them had the privilege of being in communion with our Savior. Now before you judge them, he gives us the same privilege in spite of what we've done this week, in spite of what we've done this morning. Girlfriend, I'm going to read your mail laying right there in the bed with somebody that is not your husband. Brother, I'm going to read your mail laying right there in the bed next to somebody that's not your wife. I'm not judging you. I'm just proving that grace is amazing. That he says, take drinky all of it. I don't think he was trying to say empty the cup. What he was trying to say is, I'm able to look beyond all of your shortcomings and still desire to have a relationship with you. I told him, take drink ye all of it. They commune together that night. We commune together this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Bible then declares that they went out singing a hymn into the Mount of Olives. I often say this, we don't have a Mount of Olives, but we got a Chesapeake, a Portsmouth, a Norfolk, a Georgia, a Wisconsin, California, Florida, a Maryland. Wherever your context is, it is our responsibility to go out and change the world. And so now, as I do every week, I declare, now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, present each of us faultless before the throne of God, to the only almighty God be glory and majesty, dominion and power. Favor is on its way because I declare we are favored in the city, favored in the field, favored when we come, and favored when we go. In Jesus' name. In case you're young and you don't know what they're playing, they're playing the old blood song. That's what my grandmother would call it, the blood song. Wherever you are right now, you ought to be ready to celebrate if you know it was the blood that saved you. <laughs> 